just like he will mine if I just remember that he lives deep inside. So why should I? steps leading mine, and to walk with the master all of the time. So when trials come, and death is so nigh, I'll just search for the master. He said he'll be again, please, if you will. Praise God. He spoke the word and the winds all stood still. See, even the waters, they obeyed his will. And he calmed their storms just like he Just remember that he lives deep inside. So why should I worry? Why should I fear? When the very same Jesus, he stays, he stays always near. He lives in. steps leading mine, and to walk with the master all of the time. So, so when trials come and death is so nigh, I'll just 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. This is a special day. We come to celebrate the mothers on this morning. Hallelujah. It's all about you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of the mothers that are not here, amen, we want to send out a great happy Mother's Day to all of them. Amen on this morning. Amen. We just come to lift up the Lord on this morning. We just come to give God glory, give God honor, and give God praise on this morning. Because this is the day that the Lord has made. And in spite of how we feel, in spite of what we're going through, in spite of what we have or don't have, amen, this is the Lord day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. Amen. And be glad in it. Amen. Just before I sit down and turn over to Sister Hannah, I just want to do just one verse because that's probably about all that I can do. Amen for my mom and, and, and the other moms, amen, that has gone on. It goes something like this. <clears throat> Faded rose, mama, that's all I have to give. But mama, I try to give you flowers while you live. If I had a million dollars, I'll line your grave with gold, but that wouldn't wake you from your sleep as the pillars roll. But faded rose, but pebbles from this faded rose, mama, that's all I have to give. But mama, I tried to make you happy while you live.
is this opportunity that we have to take our tithes and our offerings and put it into that offering plate and give it to the Lord. And that will push back the devourer. Amen. Our fruit won't fall to the ground before it's time. Amen. We'll be able to see our wages before they're gone. Amen. This is a great weapon in your hand that God has given to you to push back. Listen, you could snot and ball, speak in tongues and pray. But the only thing that will push back financial disparity in your life is giving. Doesn't matter how much you pray. God bless me. God bless me. God bless me. If you're not a giver, God's never ever going to bring you into a place where he can give back to you. He said, give, then it shall be given back to you. And I'm not saying this to pull an offering from you, saints. I'm trying to help us. We have to give to God. If we want the enemy of lack and poverty out of our life, give. Give joyfully. Give abundantly. In fact, Paul praised the churches of Macedonia who were in, who were in abstract poverty almost. But he said they gave more than all of the other churches and they gave out of their poverty. And so don't ever think, well, I don't have enough to give. Listen, give all that you can. Give everything that God puts in your hand to give back to him. And saints of God, he'll open you up like a funnel and he'll begin to just pour through you. Because if he can trust you to give in poverty, he can trust you to give in wealth. He can. And so let's use this great weapon of worship this morning. Our weapon of worship at this moment is offering. It is tithes and offerings. And when we come down to that offering plate, we're letting the devil know this doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. This belongs to the Lord. And you are going to have to get out of my life and my finances. You are going to have to get out of my I'm tired of cars breaking down. I'm tired of having issues in my home. I'm tired of having not enough money to be able to survive. I'm going to give. And I know that the Lord will honor his word to give back to you. Press down, shake it together in good measure. Running over, he'll cause men to pour into your bosom. So let's use our gift this morning. Let's stand our feet one more time. We're going to pray and then we're going to bring our offering before the Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And I thank you for this body of believers, God. I thank you for those who are faithful to give, God. I thank you for them, God. I thank you for their heart to give. I thank you for those who don't hold back the tithes and the offerings, Lord. I thank you for them, God, because that is an operation of faith, God. That is an operation of selflessness. That is an operation of your divine character in their life. You gave, Lord. You so loved, you gave. Now, Lord, God, help us as we worship you in our giving that the enemy, God, of lack, Lord, will be pushed out of our life. The enemy of, of financial despair will be pushed out of our life oh God and we will see the blessing of the Lord overtake us oh God that we might in turn be a greater blessing to the work of God and Lord we will give you praise glory and honor for all of this in the mighty name of Jesus we pray amen and amen brothers come let's get this offering hallelujah
serve. What a mighty God we serve. You could be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is so good to be in the house of God on this morning. And to all of you mothers, uh, again, we want to wish, it, wish you a happy Mother's Day. And uh, we thank God for you. And because uh, everybody that's a mother has not necessarily uh, had children born from them. Uh, some mothers are also uh, uh, adoptive. And some of them are adoptive without papers. Uh, there, there's, there's a wonderful thing about the church. Uh, when I see all of these children, I think, man, you guys got a lot of mothers. Amen. A lot of mothers to take care of you and to love you and, and to help you and to raise you up. And uh, so it is good to be in the house of God this morning. I want you to turn with me to Exodus 3. I do not have a Mother's Day message. I'm just going to let you know. <laughs> Hey, I was afraid about it, <laughs> but the Lord never, ever gave it to me, so, but he did give me something I think is going to bless your heart on this morning, and I thank God for all those who were out here this morning. I know that we have several that are out, not feeling well, sick, uh, but prayerfully, they'll get back on their feet, and we will see them in the house of God the next point in time, and I'm sure we have some out with their moms this morning, and uh, used to, honestly, the, the largest days of gathering for the church was uh, Easter and Mother's Day. And now you're seeing a lot of people stay home with their mothers on Mother's Day instead of being in church. And that's, that, that's sad to me. Uh, I wish we could get back to those days where moms, amen, Mother's Day was the day moms went to church and children brought their moms to church and came to church with their mothers. But a lot of moms are feeling... Uh, a lot of them feel pressured even now to stay home with their children because their children won't come to church with them. I've, I've heard from several that say, you know, used to our children felt bad about not coming with us to church. Now we feel bad about going to church without them. Uh, but we have to get those things turned around in the house of God because the greatest day, uh, the greatest way you can spend this day is with your children in the house of the living God. But I want you to go with me to Exodus 3 verse 1. Praise God. And I agree with Monique. There is a heaviness in this house. And you can feel it. And uh, I don't know who came in here with some burdens this morning. But one thing you're going to have to learn. Uh, we, we, live, we live in a generation that is so emotional. They're so emotional. My goodness. I mean, even into the church world. Now, everybody, how do you feel about this? And this is how I feel, and that's how I feel. And I, I had somebody, when I was in Texas, they asked me, they said, Brother Jared, how do you feel about that? I said, just a minute, let me get to the scripture. And when I find what the scripture says, that's how I feel about it. Whatever the word tells me to feel, it, that, that's exactly how I'm going to feel about it. And it is because we're walking with it, the church is diving in to this deception of mental health just as badly as the world is. And we are no longer governing our emotions. We're being governed by our emotions. But we have been given power through the Holy Ghost to cast down every thought and every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Listen, the world can help themselves. They have no power. They have no wisdom. They have no knowledge. And so they just sit there and they just worry about how they feel all the time. You can't worry about how you feel all the time. How do I feel about that? Let me get to the scripture. As soon as I find that verse that tells me how to feel about that, that's how I'm going to feel about it. That's how you govern your emotions as a child of God. And the thing about it is, is if there ought to be anybody, listen, I'm going to get to the scripture in a minute. But if, if, if we are to endure the persecution that's going to come on to the church and it's coming. Do you see that 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 pastor pastor in Canada? Uh, they, they've arrested him now. They arrested him on his way home from church. The one that they gated up his church on. They arrested him. They pulled him out of his car, put him right in the middle of the freeway, arrested him, cuffed him, and took him to jail. Because he went and had church. That is just north of our border, saints. That's just north of our border. That's, that's, that's not far from us. And with the... Oh, with the with the government that we're seeing come on the scene now, we're not far from that in this. For the first time in history, 
We had a president that refused to mention God on the National Day of Prayer. You think this isn't coming? It's on our doorstep. It's knocking at our door right now. And so therefore, we must have some emotional maturity. How did, in, in the current environment of emotionalism, how did the first century church survive? You think they were out there falling apart and hold on, hold on, just you just let, let's talk this out. I need to talk out how I feel about this. No, you need to pray your way out of your feelings. You need to study your way out of your feelings. You need to read your way out of your feelings because your feelings are just that. Your feelings. You can't live on feelings. You got to live in the truth. And sometimes the truth has got to get your feelings under control. And so now the church world is diving into emotionalism. Everybody's got to find out how they feel. What does it matter how I feel? Just because I feel it doesn't make it the truth. Well, this is how I feel. That does, that's not true. That's not true. Listen, you feel differently today about things than you did 10 years ago. Why? Because you've matured a little bit. You've got some experience about you. But now we've got to figure out, how do you feel? How do, what does it matter how I feel? When they're, when, they're, when they're persecuting me or my family, I can't afford to be caught up in my feelings. I walk right out on God. I'll throw in the towel. I'll, 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 I'll curse God for a tyrant and go serve his enemy. We can't live in our emotions. We have to live in the truth. And that's the reason why you have to quit thinking and you have to start reading. You have to get out of your own head and get into God's mind. And God's mind is the word of God. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We've got to get to that. We have to get to that. All right, let's go to Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see the great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. It's interesting that the Lord tells him to take his shoes off. In other words, don't bring the dust of where you've been into my presence. Don't bring the residue of your past into my presence. And most of us, that's exactly what we do. We track in the residue of our past into his presence. But really, that just defiles the whole moment. So the Lord looked at Moses and said, get your shoes off. The place you're standing right now is holy ground. Now, I want to talk to you. I want to give you some history. And we all know the history of Moses. But let's talk about this. Moses, of course, was saved by his mother when she put him in a basket and, and floated him down the river. He comes to Pharaoh's daughter, uh, who's out in the midst of the river. And, and she, she, she looks and sees that the baby is a Hebrew. And she looks at her servant and says, go find me a Hebrew woman to nurse him. Interestingly enough, she went and found his mother. And his mother stayed and, 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 and in the house of, of, of Pharaoh's daughter. And she nursed Moses uh, through this uh, time period that he needed it. Uh, you have to understand, children of God, God always makes a way where there seems to be no way. Because at this time, Pharaoh was terrified. Of the strength of Israel. He was terrified. And, and he wanted all of the male children to be killed. He wanted them uh, to be cast out into the river. And, and killed because he was terrified of their strength. But you have to understand that it doesn't matter what the enemy has in plan. God always has a purpose for every plan of the enemy. He always has a purpose for every plan of the enemy. We're going to get into this pretty heavy this morning because many of us need to understand that the enemy only has the power we grant to him. He only has the power that we accept that he has. He only has the power that we give to him. You have to understand every time the enemy takes over your life, it's because you have given him control. 
Every time the enemy is wreaking havoc in your house, it's because you've opened the door to your house. Every time the enemy is wreaking havoc in your mind, it's because you've opened the door of your mind to the enemy. Every time. Listen, you have to understand sin is always at the door knocking. The enemy is always at the door knocking and you're going to have to ask God for some discernment about you because every voice that comes into your life is not God. Some of us have to, I don't care if they claim Christ, I don't care if they claim Jesus' name, you have to be able to discern between the voice of the good shepherd and the voice of the counterfeit who's going to use his name to do whatever he wants in your life. We have to even be careful of music here. Yeah. Hannah goes through the music because every song that is written in a Christian form is not necessarily glorifying to Christ. It's not theologically correct. And so we're not going to get up here and sing it because it's culturally acceptable. We're going to get up here and sing it because it is scripturally accurate. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because the enemy slips into music and all of a sudden you'll find yourself singing something that is not in, that is contrary to the word of God because they slipped it in to a Christian song. You have to be careful what preachers, my goodness, quit watching so many podcasts. Be careful what you put into your spirit. Everybody that claims the name, listen, if they don't give scripture for it, cast it out. If they don't give the word of God for it, cast it out. If they can't prove it to you in the word of God, cast that voice out. It is not a voice of scripture. It is a voice of human reason. And the only place that human reason can take you is to the very place that God had to deliver you from in the first place. We have to get this junk out of our spirit because the enemy has a plan. Uh, men are, are, are becoming emotionally fickle. They're becoming emotionally weak. Listen, the, the, many of the men of this generation could not have survived the World War II generation. They could, have not, they could not have survived the Vietnam era. They couldn't have survived it because now they're all in their feelings. They're all in their emotions. And that is a plan of the enemy to weaken your mind. Because if he can get you in your emotions, he weakens your mind. He weakens your resolve. All of a sudden, instead of you sitting there saying, that doesn't matter how I feel about that. This is what the word of God says. It doesn't matter what I think about that. This is what the word of God says. All of a sudden, now we're engaging our emotions. We're engaging them. No, we're being governed by them. Because the enemy has a plan. Anytime the work of God begins to strengthen, the first thing the enemy goes after is men. He is terrified of male authority. He understands it. That's, that's, what, that's what blows my mind. The church has seemed to have lost the whole, the whole mentality as it pertains to the male authority that God has divinely given to men. And, and, and the enemies over here saying, no, I know how this works. I know if there's strong men that raise up, I'm in trouble. I know if there's strong men that raise up, that there's going to be a lot of strongholds broken. I know if there are strong men that raise up, I'm going to have to take a back seat. I know this. And so what do I do? I go after the men and I start messing with their emotions and their feelings. And I get it. Come on, somebody. And now preachers are no longer able to preach. We have to become psychiatrists and psychologists to try to teach you how to manage your emotions. And much of it is done through human thought. And I'm going to tell you here, as the people of God grew strong, the enemy went right after the male. He didn't go. He said, if their girls are born, leave them. But if they're men, kill them. Take them out. Because I can afford to have strong men rising up in my kingdom. They will overthrow me. But what, they didn't, what he did not understand is God always has a ram in the bush. He always has a plan for the purpose of the enemy. He always has a strategy when the enemy begins to fight against the people of God. When he begins to oppress the people of God, the enemy, the, the, the Lord always has a strategy. He has a plan. Let me tell you something. We are not without a plan. We may not see it clearly right now, but God has a plan for the purpose of the enemy. The enemy's purpose is to try to destroy, but God's plan is to show the enemy that even in the midst of his greatest attempt, he has no power over God. But God still sits high and looks low. He still has all authority. And so for some reason, God touched Moses' mother's heart. And she looked on him and saw that he was a goodly child. 
And she says, I have to protect this one. When Jesus came, go kill every male child. Two years and under. The enemy knows something has happened. Listen, whenever a man of God is born, the Lord said, told Jeremiah, before I, before I, uh, before I formed thee in the belly, I called thee. I said to him, there's something that happens in the spiritual world that you and I cannot see when a man of God is birthed into this earth. And what does the enemy do? He immediately tries to come and destroy him before he can get on his feet. Before he can ever realize who he is, he tries to destroy him. You say, is that happening now? Have you ever heard of abortion? The enemy's going, but let me tell you something. There are, there are, there are, if, if, it, if a man of God is called of God, if he's anointed of God before his birth to make an impact of the generation that he's called to, God will move aside every abortion doctor. He will not allow the abortion to take place. You will watch that man come forth because when God sends it, the enemy cannot stop it. But he's headhunting. Then he gets into their spirit uh, when they're young to emasculate them. And the society that we live in is now so feminist that men have become emasculated. And instead of mothers wanting to raise strong men, you're watching a lot of mothers try to turn their little boys into girlfriends. But we need strong men. We don't need effeminate men. We need men of God. We need men of integrity. We need men of character. And so if God has given you a male child, don't you look at that child and think that he's just something. For some reason, God let that child be born. You look at that and say, that could be the next great man of God who will turn this world upside down. Don't you raise him effeminately. Don't you raise him in a feminine fashion. You raise him to be a man. And you may say, well, I don't have anybody in my life. Find somebody, whether it be a grandfather, whether it be an uncle, whether it be a pastor or an elder. Find somebody that can get into the life of that male child and teach him how to be a man. Because no matter how much a mother wants to, only a man can teach a man how to be a man. And that's the reason why we don't need absentee fatherism. Jesus said, I will be a father to the fatherless. How does he do it? Through the church. And when we see young men in the church, we have young men that are being raised by single mothers. We cannot cast them out. Of our conscience men. Because we don't want to be bothered with them. We've got more to do in our life. We've got things we want to accomplish. We've got busyness. No we need to say Lord. You said if they forsake houses, lands, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, that I will reward them a hundredfold in the life that now is and in that which is to come. How does he do it through the church? There are so many men in this church now. That our young men who are being raised by single mothers ought to have many fathers. They ought to have many fathers. Who are, who are willing to be bothered to help raise them. To help instruct them. Amen. Well, these young men, they're this and this and this and this and this. Well, only a man can teach a man how to be a man. So if you see deficiencies... And, 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 and I wasn't even planning on talking about this, but God's wanting this church to hear this portion right here. If we see deficiencies in our young men, stop complaining about it and find your assignment in them. Whatever you see that is lacking in them, it's your assignment to put it in there. Did you hear me? Instead of you sitting there and demeaning them and putting them down and calling them whatever name you want to call them, it is your job. If God has opened your eyes to see that lack in their life, then God has given you the assignment to take what they lack and give it to them. You have it, brother. I have it, brothers. Let's take these young men and give them what we have. And so what happens? He goes and he takes, uh, he takes fathers out of the home. Uh, back in the in the 40s and 50s, within the black community, it was so strong. The families were strong. What did they do to destroy the family? They took the father out of the home. They made it harder for women to get any type of government assistance with a man in the home. Come on, somebody. And what took place? That family unit was destroyed. 
And now there are a lot of young men walking the streets of our country trying to find father figures and they're finding them in gang leaders. Come on, they're finding them in hip hop stars. Let's go, come on. Let's just get real this morning. Because they don't have any fathers. Nobody has cared to father them. And that's how the enemy destroyed that community. Now we come to the 21st century. And boys don't know. Well, don't assign your child a gender at their birth. Let them make that decision. We got a, we got a transgender uh, male who's running for the governor's seat of California. And now even conservative news organizations are applauding that junk. Not calling it a him, but a her. We're talking about conservative news organizations who used to care about this stuff. Now it's her. And the, 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 you'll notice most of it is coming after the male. You don't see young girls identifying as boys playing in male athletics. But you see numerous young men identifying as girls playing in female athletics. Because they're after the men. They're after the male. The enemy knows if I can take out the male, then that's it. I got it. And that's the reason why we must raise our young men to be emotionally strong. We cannot raise them to be governed by their emotions. We must raise them to take control of their emotions and live in the truth. And here the enemy was after this man. Because a great man of God had been born. Really a precursor to Jesus Christ had been born. A prophet like unto Moses. God would raise up among yourselves. This man of God who was about to deliver three and a half million Jews from the hand of Pharaoh was born. And the enemy knew at that moment. It's amazing that Pharaoh wasn't trying to kill the male children until Moses was born. Now Moses is born. He, he saw something. He saw it. when he wasn't, The enemy wasn't trying to kill the male children until Jesus was born. But all of a sudden we need to kill the men. Because the enemy is threatened by it. He saw something took place. He saw whether it be a shift in, 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 in the supernatural world. Or whether it be a word that he heard spoken. He saw something. But just as uh, Moses' mother did. When, 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 when Jesus was born of, of, of Mary. And, and, and Joseph took her and Jesus and he went down to Egypt and hid them until Herod's wrath had been overpassed. But we have to understand, children of God, this is an important day that we live in. If God has put male children in your life, whether it be biologically or whether it, it be children in the church, whether it be grandchildren, whether it be sons, whether it be nephews or, 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 or otherwise. Stop looking at them with disgust. And start looking at them as an assignment. I guarantee you that the mothers of this church would be more than glad for you to take them under their wings. And for you to teach them how to be men. They know they're not sufficient for the task. And so the Lord spared Moses. He took him. Uh, he took him uh, into the house of Pharaoh. He raised him. Had him raised as an Egyptian. All of the customs. He knew all of the interworkings uh, of the house of Pharaoh. God raised him in the camp of his enemy. So that he would know how to approach the enemy. When the time came for God to deliver him. God did the same exact thing for Saul of Tarsus. God allowed him to be raised under the feet of Gamaliel in the sect of the Pharisees so that when he would take this gospel into the Gentiles, when the Pharisees would come in, Paul would be able to sniff that out and he would be able to push back against that system that was trying to infiltrate the church. Good God in heaven. You have to understand God always has a purpose, a plan for every purpose of the enemy. Maybe God spared you when you
you were in an environment of hell and hot water. Well, what did he do it for? So that you could turn your nose up and forget where you come from? Or did God put you in that environment because somebody's coming down the pot? Because there's, there's another you coming down. And instead of you ignoring your history, you need to be able to take some knowledge from your past and say, you know what? I know where you are, but I also know where I am. And let me show you what God can do from where you are to where I am. Good God. He allowed him to be raised in the house of Pharaoh. Then one day, Moses is out walking amongst the Hebrews. Because he knows he's not an Egyptian. He knows he's a Hebrew. He knows it. He knows it. He sees this guard mistreating this one gentleman. And he took him and killed him and hit him in the earth. And it was found out and Moses had to flee into Midian from the face of Pharaoh. But we have to understand something, children of God. That that was all in God's plan. Moses would never be the deliverer as long as he was still in Egypt. There are too many of God's children. Listen, Egypt is a type of the world. In the scripture, Egypt is a type of the world. There are way too many of God's people trying to remain in the world and deliver those who are captured by the world. But in order for God to deliver his people, he had to take Moses out of Egypt take him into another land so that he could bring him back to Egypt. Before God's ever going to use you as a great deliverer in your life, you're going to have to absolutely, 100% totally come out of the world. God cannot use us to deliver people out of the world as long as we find our home there. Ah, good God in heaven. You're going to have to be cast out from this world. You're going to have to flee from this world. You're going to have to flee for hope. And so he goes out into Midian. And Jethro's daughters find him and they bring him into Jethro's camp. Jethro makes him a shepherd over his sheep. Moses has no clue at this point. God's getting ready to make him a shepherd over Israel. But before he could be a shepherd over three and a half million, he had to be a shepherd over a few sheep and be faithful to them. God did the same thing. Saints, there's so much in this message. God did the same thing to David. When David came down with food for his brethren from his father Jesse and Goliath was there, His brethren looked at him and said, what have you done with those few sheep of our fathers? Where have you left them at? Because David didn't realize he was about to be the shepherd of Israel. But before he could ever be the shepherd of Israel, he had to be a faithful shepherd over the few sheep that his father had given. Listen, this is not an elevator. You're not going to come in and feel an anointing. And then God shoots you to the top of the ladder. This is a stairway. It's one step at a time. He said, if you be faithful in a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. And because we live in a microwave age where everybody wants to have it their way. Everybody thinks I come in, I feel, ooh, I'm anointed to the top of the ladder. No. No, no, no. You stay right here. And you be faithful over this little stuff, God can you. Because if you'll be faithful over the small stuff, God will trust you with the greater things. Good God in heaven. You serve those few sheep. You serve whoever God puts you in place to serve. Serve them. Serve them with your whole heart. Serve them with all you got. Don't worry about the number of them. Worry about your service to them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not about the number. It is about your heart, your motivation, your faithfulness. So before God would make him a shepherd of three and a half million, he had to take him on the backside of the desert and say, you tend these few sheep. You be faithful to these few sheep. Good God. Moses is out taking the sheep around. And all of a sudden, he looks and there's a bush that burned. A bush that burned. But it was not consumed. 
because he couldn't figure out it. It was something abnormal. It was something. It was something he had never seen before. Listen, there are things about God that you will see on the backside of the desert that you will never see in the limelight. <laughs> I have not learned about God in the limelight as much as I have learned about God in the backside of the desert. A lot of people hate the backside of the desert because the backside of the desert almost seems demeaning. It seems humiliating. Why am I here, God? I know more. I'm, I feel like I'm more. No, I feel like I've got more. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter about what you have. It matters about the motivation of your heart. And it is the backside of the desert that reveals the motivation of your heart. It's can you serve when you don't hear the applause? Can you serve when your name is not on the flyer? Can you serve when your name is not on the marquee? Can you still serve God when you're not up here with your name in lights? Can you still serve God when nobody notices that you're there? Can you serve God when you don't hear thank you? Can you serve God? Because it's not about how people react. It is about what you do. Can you serve God in the backside of the desert? Can you see God on the backside of the desert? Amen. I'm concerned about some children of God because the only time they're spiritual is when the lights are on. Uh -huh. But can you see God on the backside of the desert? Can God get your attention on the backside of the desert? Or are you angry and depressed and feel like you're being mistreated and feel like nobody cares about you and feel like you're being pushed backward? Can you still see God on the backside of the desert? Moses came from being a prince of Egypt to being a lonely shepherd on the backside of the desert. Good God in heaven. And yet he still was able to see the hand of God on the backside of the desert. I'm telling you, if you are in the backside of the desert, look for God. There's a burning bush somewhere. Look for the arm of the Lord. He's going to speak out to you. Good God in heaven. Can you see him on the backside of the desert? Can you recognize him on the backside of the desert? Then he says, God speaks out to Moses and says, Moses, Moses. So in other words, even if he had been a, even if he had been a foregone thought in the minds of the house of Pharaoh, God knew where he was. Let me help you. Some of us are still seeking the approval of people that God is trying to deliver us from. Your dad may never ever be okay with where you are. Your mother may never ever be okay with where you are. Your grandparents, your friends, your family members, your co they may never ever be okay with where you are. Why are you here? Why are you there? Why can't you just come over here? Why can't you just do this? What's wrong with you? Why can't you? Why can't you? Why can't you? Why can't you? Listen, they may never ever be satisfied with where you are, but God's trying to deliver you from them because he needs you to follow the lamb, not them. Oh, I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. He needs you to follow the lamb, not them. Because I want you to understand the backside of the desert is a season. It's only a season. But the length of that season is going to be determined by your response to it. Oh God, help us. I said the length of that season is going to be determined by your response to it. How will you respond on the backside of the desert? Will you fall out on God? Will you get angry with God? Will you get depressed? Will you get all into your feelings and your emotions? Well, how do you feel about that? What does it matter how I feel about it? This is where God has me. This is what I'm doing right now. And the only thing I know is to be faithful to God right here and right now. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. You say, Brother Jared, how do you keep your emotions so even killed? Because it does not matter how I feel. I have an assignment to be faithful to God where I am right now. So I don't care how I feel about it. What's it matter? So you're telling me you don't have any feelings? Oh, no, I get feelings. But you know what I do? I go out and mow my yard. I go out and walk around. I go in here to the church and I pray. I go in my office and I pray. While I'm doing all of that, I'm getting me under control. 
I'm forcing my thoughts to yield to my truth. And my truth is the word of God. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. I've kept them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. How you feel is not truth. What you think is not truth. The word is truth. So I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll find myself out mowing, grumbling. You know, I'll, I'll be in my fields. But then I start to go, wait a minute, Jared. Hey, Amen. I put some worship music in my ears. And I start talking to me and God. <laughs> and I start telling God how grateful I am for him. And I start telling me to get myself under control. Because I, I can't afford to be in my feelings. I have to be in the truth. Praise God. So what do you do on the backside of the desert? Moses says, here I am. Can you respond to God on the backside of the desert? Can you? Because I'm going to tell you something. Some of your greatest miracles are going to be on the backside of the desert. God will show you. I'm telling you, saints. You say, how do you know, Pastor Jerry? Because I have been there, done that, got my T-shirt, rode the roller coaster, amen, ate the cotton candy. I have been there. I have been on the backside of the desert where I felt like nothing I didn't matter. Where I felt like I was in complete and utter hell and hell. There was no hope. But it was in those moments I kept looking for God. It was in those moments I kept looking for the Lord. Lord, I know you're here somewhere. Because how do you know that, Brother Jared? Because the foundation of the Lord standeth sure having this hill. The Lord knoweth them that are his. <laughs> Everybody else may have forgotten about me, but God knows where I am. Job said, I looked before me and you weren't there. I looked behind me, you weren't there. I looked on either side of me, you weren't there. He said, but thou knowest the way I take. And when I am tried, I will come forth this pure gold. Saints of God, as long as you know God knows where you are, it doesn't matter how you feel, you just keep being faithful. You just keep serving God. You just keep worshiping. You just keep studying. You just keep reading. You just keep coming to church. You just keep witnessing. It doesn't matter if you ever get any applause. God is up there. And as long as he is pleased with you, you have fulfilled your assignment. But there is a burning bush for you on the backside of the desert. And the backside of the desert is a test. Can you take it? Because if you can't take the backside of the desert with a few sheep, how are you ever going to be put in the forefront of anything God's doing? You've got to be able to be trusted on the backside of the desert. And the Lord called out to Moses and Moses responded. And Moses started making his way. Toward the burning bush. And the Lord says stop right there. Take your shoes off. God taught him how to approach him. On the backside. <laughs> because there is a way you approach God. And this generation is, a, is, is filled with a bunch of spoiled rotten children. That think that Jesus is the sugar daddy. That has to do everything they ask him to do. But I'm telling you there is a proper way to approach the Lord. You approach him in honor. You approach him in humility. You approach I said, well, bless God, I read in the word that I can go boldly before the throne of grace and make my petition known in the time of need. Do you know what the word boldly there just means? It means that you can go there without fear of dying. Amen. Doesn't mean you walk up into the throne room and say, hey, big guy, let me tell you what you're going to do for me. Amen. Name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it. You get out of here with all that mess. You better learn how to go humbly before God. You're not talking about your homie. Come on, you're not talking about your daddy. You're talking about the most high God. Yes, you should be able to approach him as a father, but you ought to be able to approach him reverently and humbly and with worship in your heart. You can't even get to him without first going through the gate of thanksgiving and the courts of praise. Good God. He said, don't you bring your, the residue of the past into my presence. And some of us are going to have to knock this off. There are people that are not going to approve of what you do. What do you do then? You take your shoes off and you shake the dust of your feet off against them. As a testimony and you go yonder. We have to quit taking our, 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 our abuses of our past into God's presence. 
God will heal that if you'll just say, Lord, here it is. Don't take it into his presence. Leave it at his altar. You can't go into the holy place without going by the altar. Did you hear what I said? You can't go into the holy place without first passing the altar. Before you go into his presence, lay that at the altar. You think God doesn't want that from you? He wants that. He wants you to lay that down at the altar. He doesn't want that inside of you for the remainder of your life. Let God know. Let God cast all your care upon him. For he cares for you. And a lot of times we hold on to the residue of the past because we want an explanation. God, tell me why I had to go through. God, why, 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 why? Always asking why. Let me change you. Let me help you change your mindset. Instead of asking why all the time, thank God that you survived. Because you know what why will do in your spirit? It will create a bitterness in your spirit that you can't get past. Why was I abused? Why was I ostracized? Why was I alienated? Why didn't my dad care? Why didn't my mother care? Why did I not have any friends? Why was I alone? Or why did I have to go through depression? Why, 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 why? Get that out of your spirit. The enemy will never allow the answer that you want to come to you. Just say, Lord, thank you. That if my mother didn't love me, I've got a lot of mothers now to love me. Thank you, Lord, that if my father forsook me, I've got a lot of fathers now who will be right there with me. Thank you, Lord, that if my friends forsook me, I now have brothers and sisters in the Lord that I can walk with. Quit trying to get God to justify why you went through what you went through and just thank God that you're not there anymore. Well, it's not fair. <laughs> fair. Let me. You know what fair is? Fair is a human perspective. There's nothing truth about fair. Well, this is not fair, and that's not fair, and that's not fair, and that's not fair. It's not fair from your perspective. So get get it out of your head. Was it fair? I mean, here, this Moses. All he was doing was protecting one of the Hebrew men. And then he has to leave his home, be exiled into the desert, to the land of Midian, to become a shepherd of some of his father-in-law's sheep, and marry a woman that couldn't stand nothing about God about him. She couldn't tolerate it. When they were leaving Egypt, by the way, on their way, or leaving Midian on their way to Egypt, they stop at an inn. The Bible said that God visited, that Jehovah visited Moses to kill him. You know why he was going to kill him? Because he didn't circumcise his son. You know why he didn't circumcise his son? Because his wife didn't want him to. His wife realizing that God was judging Moses took a stone, a flint, and cut the foreskin of her son off and cast it out of his feet and said, all you are is bloody to me. She hated the things of God. She detested the things of God. How is any of this fair? Fair is just human perspective. It has nothing to do with truth. God knows what you're going through. And he's helping you to survive. Be happy. There are other people that have went through what you went through and they didn't survive. But you did. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them are so strung out on drugs you can't even hardly hold a decent conversation with them. Others of them are in insane asylum somewhere. But you made it through, not because of you, but because God held on to you. You survived because of the goodness of God. You survived because of the grace of God. Amen. So instead of you sitting there and trying to figure out why your life wasn't fair and why you had to go through, just say, thank you, God, that I am here. Thank you, God, that I am clothed and in my right mind. Thank you, Lord, that I went through all of that and I came out and the smell of smoke's not even on me. The problem I'm having with God's people is even though the smell of smoke is not on them, they keep walking back into the fire to try to get a... Because they want to walk around and everybody smell the smoke of the fire they just came out of. Why can't you just be satisfied? You weren't there. People have to know I was a victim. Can you 
you believe that they threw me into that fire? Can you believe what I just went through and you're wanting everybody to smell the smoke on your clothes? You need to learn as a child of God that there are some things God's going to let you go through. The fire won't touch you. The smoke won't lay on you. And you will come out like you never went through it. Just be happy you're still here. to Jethro his father-in-law and said unto him let me go I pray thee and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt he didn't say let me return to my brother who was in Egypt he wasn't talking about the house of Pharaoh he was talking about the children of God as long as we still have a worldly identity. We're never going to reach the purpose of God for our life. He had to reckon, I'm not of this world. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of Israel. And those be my brethren. There was no straddling the fence for him. He was going to his brethren. We have got to come out of the house of Pharaoh, children of God, and quit identifying with the world. We pray for them. We witness to them. We talk to them. We try to pull as many as we can out of the fire while we can. But we are not their brethren. We are not their sisters. Well, who is my brother and who is my sister? He that doeth the will of my father. You are my brothers and my sisters. If my natural family decided today to walk out on God and never return, you would be my brothers and my sisters. Because the brothers and the sisters are they that do the will of the Father. And there is this doctrine finally weaving its way into the church that we're all brothers and sisters. Muslim or Catholic. Hindu or Buddhist. We all serve the same God and we are all brothers of the same Father. No, we are not. There is only one name given unto heaven by which we must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. That is my Father's name. That is the family name. I can't go into the kingdom without it. They are not my brothers. They are not my sisters. They are God's creation. But my brothers and my sisters are they that do the will of my Father that is in heaven. So he's on his way to Egypt to go to his brethren. Remember Jesus said, lest you hate father and mother, sister and brother. Follow me, you're not even worthy of my kingdom. And hate doesn't mean with a violent, vitriolic anger. It means unless you love me more, and until your children stop you from, no longer can stop you from serving God. Until your parents can no longer stop you from serving God. Until your spouses can no longer stop you from serving God. Until your siblings can no longer stop you from serving God. Until they no longer have the power or authority over you to hinder you from being faithful to God. You're not worthy. Not worthy of it. Children of God. We can love our relatives, but we must love God more. We can love our family members, but God must be the object of our affection. I'm going to my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. 
And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, go return into Egypt. For all the men are dead which sought thy life. While Moses was on the backside of the desert, God was killing his enemies. I know you feel like you're ostracized on the backside of the desert. But really, God knows that he's got to put your enemies down before he can ever bring you into the forefront of God's purpose for your life. They got to go. And let me tell you something. I'm not talking about physically dying. God's got to kill them in your heart. He's got to kill their influence. He's got to kill their authority. It has to, that way, when you go into the purpose of God for your life, the only enemy you will face is, the, is God's enemy. You will have no enemies. The Lord said, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he will cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. Doesn't mean that they won't be raised in hell. It just means it won't bother you. Are you hearing what I'm saying, children of God? The backside of the desert, God will show you who the enemy is. It's not the men that sought your life. It's not the men that tried to destroy your ministry. That's not your enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Moses, while you're here, all those enemies are dying. Because when I go, when you go to be for Pharaoh, I can't have you looking over your shoulder. I can't have you continuing to worry about your enemies. The enemy at hand is Pharaoh. Children of God, we have an enemy, but it's not your brother or your sister. They're gonna, those those, those, those uh, uh, moments of warfare are going to have to die in your spirit. Because if you're not careful, and let me tell you something, I know from experience, if you're not careful, you will use the purpose of God to try to kill the enemies that the Lord has already extinguished. As a, once they're out of your life, they're no longer... They no longer have influence. And the only way they have influence is for you to continue to think about them. I don't need you worrying about your enemies when you go before Pharaoh Moses. While you're on the backside of the desert, I'm going to let all them die. So that when you go, because in order for the Lord to have said this to Moses, Moses must have been worried still yet about the men who sought to take his life. He must have still been worried because the Lord said, now they're all dead. Now go to Pharaoh. If you don't extinguish these enemies, some of y'all got so many enemies. I Listen, and you, you preachers listen to me because I'm going to tell you from experience. I see some of y'all on Facebook and they're constantly attacking their enemies. I mean, after the enemies. I, I've done it. Been there. Done that. Guess what? It just eliminates your purpose. All it does is keep you looking over here. When you should be looking unto Jesus. Listen. The only way they can destroy you. Is if you give in to their influence. But if God be for us. Why don't you get on Facebook and attack your enemies anymore pastor. Because it doesn't matter. One thing that God showed me was. Is nobody would have power over me. He told Joshua. He said all the days of your life. No man will be able to stand before you. Wherever you put your foot down. I'm going to give it to you. So in other words, what the Lord said, as long as you're following me, there's no one who can successfully withstand you. And there are some of us, we just keep cracking at our enemies. Keep, you think they're ever going to come to you and say, I'm sorry? Well, no, I, I don't. I, no, no, there ain't no way. I think it's not possible. Then quit talking to them. The only reason why you keep bringing them up is because you think somewhere in your heart that they're going to turn around someday and say they were wrong. Listen, your enemy then has become your own ego. Good God in heaven. Nobody's going to apologize to you unless God deals with them. But if they apologize to you, it better be on the way of God's purpose for your life. It better not you continually be you continually engaging the battle. Good God in heaven. Listen, there are men that have risen up against me to try to destroy me multiple times. And you know what the Lord has done? He's allowed them to do whatever they wanted to me as long as I was looking at them. But the moment I turned my eyes to the Lord, he dealt with them immediately. Ah, oh, good God in heaven. You say, do you have enemies, Brother Jared? I'm sure I do. I don't know, but I'm not focused on them. 
Does God put me on the backside of the desert and say, you're going to stay right here until they're dead. I want out of the backside of the desert to let your enemies die. Oh, y'all quiet now. Well, how do they die? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's the only way they die is for you to look to Jesus. The only way they die is for you to quit worrying about what they told you you would never do and what they told you you could never be and how mistreated you were and how awful they talked about you. The only way they die is for you to quit listening to the voice of your past good God. Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground now. Get the residue of that past off your feet. You can't take the residue of your history into the presence of God's purpose in your life. Shake that dust off. Get your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground now. Don't you bring your enemies into God's presence. Don't you bring those thoughts into God's presence. Don't you bring those words into God's presence. Did it destroy you? No. Did it take you out? No. Does it have power over you? No. The only power it has is you keep listening. I'm not listening to them anymore. <laughs> if you're still out to prove them wrong, you're still listening. <laughs> Look at my ministry now. Yeah. Proving all my enemies wrong. No, you're proving all your enemies right. And all that stuff they said you would never do, you'll never do. Because those enemies aren't dead yet. <laughs> You're still on the backside of the desert thinking that you've arrived. You ain't even started the journey yet because you won't let your enemies die. You won't let their influence die. You won't let their words die. But God told Moses, he said, look, get up. Go on now. Your enemies are all dead. <laughs> When you go into this place, I can't afford for you to be distracted. I need you to be focused. Your enemies are dead now. Get yourself up. Go on to Egypt. I got to use you while you're there. <laughs> Good God in heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, God. And what I love about the Lord is, is he'll never, ever send you alone. Moses, Moses in his own heart, because he had not gained that confidence in God yet, he felt so disqualified for the job that was at hand. But the Lord said, don't you, don't, don't you have a brother named Aaron? Will you go get him? I know he can talk. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, well, Lord, how will I be able to tell them that I am sent me? Because I am, it's not some, uh, it's not some uh, statement toward God. I am just means I am what I am. He wasn't saying I am as in Elohim. He was just saying I am what I am. So in other words, who sent me? Whatever you need. <laughs> the God who is. The God who was. The God who always will be. That's who sent me. Well, how will they know? He said, what do you got in your hand? I just got this stick. I just got this, this, this stick of wood. The Lord said, throw it down. Turned into a serpent. Moses steps back. He's terrified. Because God had shown him something he had never seen before. And the Lord said, now take him by his tail. And the serpent was taken up in his hand and turned back to a stick. What's the first thing that he did when he got to Egypt? Oh, children of God, quit worrying about your enemies. Quit worrying about the things that will withstand you when you get there. Some of us borrow so much trouble. Good God. Well, what's going to happen? Oh, God, what do people want? What do people don't? And what do people do? And what do people... Stop all that mess. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. For today, the evil is sufficient. Quit worrying about that mess. Quit borrowing trouble. God's giving you everything that you need. And God won't ever send you alone. He'll put you in with some people. That will do what is necessary until you can come into the person that God has called you to be. But your enemy's got to die on the backside of the desert. You got to shake the dust of your feet off on the backside of the desert. 
you got to be able to recognize God on the backside of the desert. Good God. Good God, help us, Lord. You got to be able to hear the voice of God on the backside of the desert. You got to know that God knows where you are on the backside of the desert. Because let me tell you something Midian was just a season, it was just a moment. Just a moment. He led the children of Israel just as many years in the wilderness as he lived in Midian. He was 40 years on the backside of the desert and 40 years as a leader of God's people in the wilderness. You may think, how long am I going to be here? Well, that largely is going to be up to how you're responding. And some of us, we're so emotional. We just feel about everything. Well, that's just perfectly human, Pastor Jared. Well, it is. But if any man be in Christ, he's indeed a new creature. Amen. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So as a carnal, lost human being, you may feel all kinds of ways about all kinds of things. But as a child of God, even your emotions must be transformed. Amen. You say, I don't think that could happen. Okay. Stephen is being stoned to death yeah. because he preached the gospel right. to some stiff-necked right. Sadducees and Pharisees. Who he looked at and said, you stiff-necked in heart and in mind, ye always do resist the Holy Ghost, even as your fathers do, so do you. And they got angry at him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. It would be perfectly natural for Stephen to say, well, this is not fair. Oh, oh is this what we get, God? You called me. I've been doing wondrous works. I've been performing miracles, watching over the widows. And now this is what I get out of serving God. Well, that's just perfectly. That's a natural human emotion. I mean, from a natural place, you could see how Stephen could feel that could be horribly unfair to him. That is not what Stephen said. He said, Father, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their charge. <laughs> you want to know why? Because the Holy Ghost hadn't just transformed his tongue. It transformed his emotions. It transformed his thoughts. It changed everything about him. Till a man by the name of Saul. Who was destroying the church. Persecuting without measure. Wasting it. Became the greatest promoter. Of the church he tried to destroy. And guess what? He got his head cut off for it. He got beaten and thrown into prison. His eyes were bad. How's that fair? I mean really. Lord I would think by now. That me having turned my life over to you and actually I've repented here and I've, I've gone the right way. I've done everything you've asked me to do. I've, I've been, you know, you can't touch my eyes. You can't heal my eyes. Is this way we're doing it now? But God said, <laughs> no, no, no. That's there so you don't get exalted above measure. This is good for you. And I'm not going to heal your eyes. I'm just going to give you grace to be able to take it. There's some of us, God, take this off me, take this off me. Why don't you first ask God, what's the purpose of this? And if your purpose is to keep my spirit in check with this, then God, just give me the grace to take it. Amen. But how's this fair, Lord? I don't see how this is fair. This is not right. I mean, I'm doing everything I can. Thrown into prison? Are you kidding me? Oh, you can deliver Peter out of prison. But me? Oh, I see how this... Peter's your favorite. You can smack Peter on the side on his side and wake him up, take him even through the brass gates and the iron gates, and all you can deliver, Peter. Okay, I see how it is. Oh, the fire's 
burning. All I'm doing is trying to put wood on the fire here to keep everybody warm, and you let a snake bite me. I don't see how any of this is fair. Oh, so you send me to Rome. And before I get to Rome, I get shipwrecked. Drift out in the sea for a couple days. Oh, this is not fair at all. What servant God got me? Are you all following me? Well, that would be perfectly natural emotion. But that's not the emotion of a Holy Ghost filled child of God whose mind is being transformed by the word. This is what you learn on the backside of the desert. Are you going to be perfect when you leave the backside of the desert? Nope. But you'll be ready to face the real enemy. So, Brother Jared, what should I do? Learn in whatsoever state you are. Be content. If you're on the backside of the desert, thank you, Lord, for this. I don't know what I'm going to experience while I'm here. But, Lord, I know that I'm going to see you in it. I'm going to hear your voice. You're going to be killing all my enemies. Until when you finally take me out of the backside of the desert and push me back on my way back home, I'll be prepared to encounter the real enemy when I get there. I can tell you today, saints, honestly, I have had animosity and anger and bitterness and even at times revenge in my spirit against people because of how they have done me and things they've done to me and said to me. And one day I just woke up and I thought, wait a minute, I'm still here. I'm alive. The church is still here. God's still speaking to me. I'm still able to serve God. I'm all right. I'm all right. And I stopped worrying about the criticism and I started praising God for the deliverance. There are some people that can't walk with you where you're going and you're just going to have to accept it. Because two cannot walk together unless they be agreed. There are some people God's just going to pull right up out of your life. And instead of you being bitter that they left, thank God that you were delivered. I was talking to Brother Hill about a change that had happened during our ministry some time ago. And he looked at me and he said, Brother Jared, I didn't want to be the one to tell you, but I knew that was going to have to happen a long time ago for you to move forward. I've had three or four men tell me that. While I was sitting there angry because people left, it was just deliverance. Are you angry at them? I'm not. Do you have any bitterness in your heart? No, I don't. There's nothing in my spirit. I'm telling you, there's nothing in my spirit about it. I'm fine with it. You want to know why? Because it wasn't that they walked away. God delivered me. If you got to hold on to them, saints, they're already walking away. If you have to drag them, there are walking away. So when God lets people walk out of your life, it may hurt for a minute, and it does. But just sit there and say, Lord, where are we going now? Where are we going now? Better days ahead. Greater days ahead. I'm not going to get angry anymore about it. I'm not going to let myself be emotionally tore up about it anymore. You let them go. John said if they left us, uh, they left us because they were not of us. For had they been of us, then surely. You just have to learn. Okay. Okay. On your way, I'm just going to follow the Lord. And I'm not going to be angry at you because if God ever works this out in your spirit, maybe you'll come back around and you'll walk with us again. And maybe you won't. But nevertheless, I'm going on with the Lord. Amen. 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 Whew, I hope this has blessed you. I know this is not a Mother's Day message, but saints, we got to hear every word that the Lord has said today.
and let God help us. The backside of the desert is just for a season. Be, be looking for God because when he reveals himself to you, you'll be on your way into the very purpose that God has created you for. All right, we've got a few things we want to pray for here. Uh, Sister Joy has asked us to pray for her and Brother Rick. They're both sick, so we want to pray for them. I know Leslie is out sick today, so we want to pray for her. Um, Sister Lindy is out sick. We want to pray for her. Um, I'm trying to think if there's someone else. Well, we want to pray for the saints that are not here today for whatever reason. Maybe some of them with their mothers. Maybe some of them, uh, maybe they stayed up too late last night. <laughs> But for whatever reason, they're not here. We pray that God will keep tugging on their heart and draw them back. We will have service tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, somebody said, but it's Mother's Day. I understand. Go be with your mother. Have dinner with her. Enjoy your time with her. Amen. But then we're going to come back to our mother, which is New Jerusalem above, which is free, the mother of us all. We're going to go into the mountain of God. And we're going to have a wonderful time tonight. So invite people to come to church. Let's come back with testimonies and a word in our heart, worship in our spirit. Um, and let's just pray for those who are sick. We want to, uh, women's prayer is going to be this Tuesday at 630. Sister Ashley's baby shower is going to be May the 15th at 2 p.m. Our next doctrine class is going to be May 17th at 7 p.m. And that is barring. I don't have some type of flight delay coming home from Memphis, so y'all pray. Um, we need donations for snacks for kids, church, and nursery. Especially if your children are a part of that, bring some snacks. We we need we need help on that end. Please see Sister Shonda for more info. All right. Let's see here. Um, if you would like to volunteer in the prison ministry, please see Brother Joe and talk to him about that uh, and let him know. I want to keep praying for the street ministry. If you would like to help on the street ministry, whether it's praying with people, talking with people one-on-one, -on -one, preaching, or holding up signs. See Brother David or Sister Michaela, Sister Ashley, or Sister Caitlin, one of them, and talk to them about it. They surely would love to have your help uh, as you can, and absolutely, let's keep them in prayer. Um, all right, we've got a presentation. Oh, School of Word Night is the 21st at 7 p.m. Everybody in the church is invited. We want everybody to come out and celebrate what the kids have done this year. They've worked hard, and we want to celebrate their hard work. All right. You can tell the children, all of them, they can come in now. We've got a presentation here. Sister Donna. You come up here, because I already know. I'm not even worried about that one. Who is the youngest mother in this church? Youngest mother. Who's the youngest? I didn't say that, Sister Donna. I did not say that. Michaela? Tori. Where's Tori at? Is she in the nursery still? All right, tell her to come in. <laughs> just, she said, I don't care. I'm just glad to be here. All right, Tori is the youngest mother, and Sister Donna is the most seasoned mother. <laughs> and so we have got a bouquet of flowers for Sister Donna and for Tori to say happy Mother's Day. Day. Is it is this one? All right. Sister Donna, this goes to you. And then Tori, this goes to you. And to all you mothers, may God bless you very much today. And God be with you and let you spend wonderful time with your family. And uh, we love you. And hopefully we'll see you tonight. God bless you, ladies. God bless you. God bless you. All right, Brother Joe, you want to close us in a word of prayer? We had some powerful challenge today. 
I'm going to ask you to think with me a minute. Just for a minute. I'm not going to keep you long. But when we have trouble, instead of thinking we're different or special, remember everybody has trouble. Wears a different suit of clothes for some than it does others. But we all have trouble. I try to learn things from everybody I come in contact with. A man in the prison told me one time his grandmother <coughs> raised him, and he said, One of the things she taught me I wish I'd listened to. She said, Son, when you have trouble, don't always pray for relief. Sometimes pray for a stronger back. Yeah. Carry your load. You know, we all got a load to carry. And sometimes we think, well, God doesn't love me because he won't take it off. But you young folks, when you're trying to do something physical, you have to be in condition for it. So instead of saying, Lord, take my load away. No, Lord, give me a back strong enough to carry it. We all got problems. We all got troubles. But thank God he's got all the answers. Thank you, Lord, for this service. So we come together again tonight, Lord, watch over each and every one of the people here. Those who weren't able to be here, Lord, give them strength to overcome. And Father, we just thank you for the blessing of the message and give us the strength to endure in Jesus' name. Amen.